Hi, I'm Ryan Malone, Music Director at Herbert W. Armstrong College and Imperial Academy based here in Edmond, Oklahoma at the Philadelphia Church of God World Headquarters. Welcome back to the sixth lesson of our conducting tutorials. So far we have covered the basic principles involved in starting and stopping the sound on whatever beat or half beat where that may occur. We've addressed cueing, fermatas, tempo changes. In lessons four and five, we discussed aspects that have to do less with the mechanics of conducting and more to do with the decisions you make as a conductor, either in interpreting the score or planning an efficient and effective rehearsal. Again, these are based on a symposium we held back in 2004 and which was based on one I had attended a few years prior to that. They condensed the years of instruction I received from my choral conducting teacher, Dr. David Rail, into a single day and I've been repackaging that material into these concise videos and mostly been expanding them to cover all types of conducting, not just choral conducting. But today I want to talk specifically to choral conductors. As a choral conductor, your job is to get the best sound from your group, and oftentimes that requires passing on aspects of vocal technique. Is this something a choral conductor should be able to do? Should this be done? The answer to both questions is yes. A choral conductor can encourage and, in a limited way, teach good vocal technique. But there are limitations and dangers even, but there is nothing wrong with reinforcing certain basics. This will get us into the area of how to vocalize your choirs, which some conducting students can be lost as to what to do in this regard. To do this, I want to use video from my lecture back in 2004, since I feel that it doesn't need much updating, and I can add some text or some extra things as we go along to help enhance the instruction. This is where we get into vocal exercises, and so that's something that um, I'm sure all of you are like, well, what do I do when I, well, how do I warm up the group, you know? And that's one thing that I want to talk about is the, the like I said, again, the power of language. Instead of, you know, we, we say certain things, but they really don't mean that or they give the false, a false impression. And if we say warm-ups, it, it's not like you, these are these magical scales and you just sing them and all of a sudden you're good to go. But they're, but they're voice building exercises or they're, or they're vocal exercises. Or you're going to say, instead of saying let's warm up, say let's vocalize. You, that would be the verb, you know, let's vocalize. Um, vocal exercises must be planned and they must have a specific purpose. It's, like I said, it's not like you sing these magical scales and then all of a sudden, you know, you're going to sing beautifully. Um, there's one teacher that that my teacher was telling me about who, who every day in high school choir, she would, she would uh, put on a tape of scales, you know. And then everyone would sing these scales to the tape and she would go in her office and like do attendance and, and like take care of paperwork and then, then she would come back out at the end of those, those exercises and go, wow, aren't those just great exercises? And then now let's sing, you know, and it was like, what, what was really being, you know, what, what was that really teaching anyone about, about vocal technique? What was that teaching them about using their voice? I'm just giving you a lot of, a lot of things to cover. You would not use all these in one rehearsal, okay, <laughs> just so you know that. Um, but you might have one from each major category that I've, that I've put here. Now, the, one question is how long to vocalize. I've written that down so you would have that there. I, I said if it's a one-hour rehearsal, usually five minutes of vocalization is good. If, if, if it's, say, let's break this down for like the feast or something like that. If, if I were, you know, you have that morning rehearsal that's maybe 45 minutes long. Give, give, give them four or five minutes. I mean, that's good I mean, to do five minutes even though it's a shorter rehearsal just because it's early. It's good to get them, get them singing so they're not hurting themselves when they just launch into this, you know, this loud, boisterous piece or something like that. Um, if it's a two-hour rehearsal, I think seven minutes is pretty good. If it's a four-hour rehearsal, because we, we, we deal with these four-hour monsters um, it, before the feast, then I think ten minutes should be plenty. Just because just they're going to be singing a lot, you know, don't, don't be spending 15 to 20 minutes on kind of these theories of, of voice building and then not get to the practical application. Because it's about, you want to bridge that gap between theoretical, okay, we have this scale, 
What does that have to do with, with this, though? So what are, what are we teaching him in those that we can ex, you know, extract and put into the actual piece, the actual reality of singing? So we don't want to oversing them, and we also need to make sure the, the voice building exercises have practical applications in the music, in the music that we're singing, because that's what counts. I mean, that's, that's the end. That's the product right there. The first major category is posture. And I, I really like the way Dr. Rail talked about this is his, his phrase was that it's creating the instrument. This piano's posture is perfect. Okay, this piano is already made. It was, you know, it's, it's not changing. The structure of this instrument is, is going to be the same for a long, long time. I mean, it could, you know, change minor over time with things in wood and all that stuff and if someone spills something on it or whatever. But the, but the idea is that the instrument's already created. When you play a clarinet, the instrument is, you know, you, well, sometimes woodwinds have to assemble the instrument, but then it's created. It's, it's, it's there in, in final form. Now, singers have to create their instrument. They have to, um, you know, get, get, that's what posture is about. It's about putting the instrument together and about putting it together in the right way so that it can, you know, facilitate the singing that's going to be taking place. Okay, a singer always has to create his or her instrument. There's, there's all, it's like, it's like this constant creation and recreation that's going on where you're, you're just constantly having to keep the group maintained of their posture so they don't, they don't let it slide because when they're singing, it, you know, the sound could be suffering if, if, you know, after a while they just start slouching and, and crossing their, their, their legs, which is the biggest no-no. Don't let them cross their legs. No, you can cross your ankles now. This is not singing. But <laughs> everyone starts to sit up whenever you talk about posture. Uh, then... Um, so you must keep recreating the instrument. So you create the instrument, and you have to continuously maintain what you've created, kind of thing. That's what, that's what we can teach about posture. Now, there are, there are some ways to arrive at good posture, some ways of teaching good posture that I think are really helpful for singers. Uh, stretching, you know, is what just, you know, have them stretch and reach, and then, you know, just have them drop. That, you know, stretching just gets people to feel really tall, and then when they drop, you know, they can just feel keep, the, maintain that tall feeling. Also, uh, moving shoulders in circles, you know, like exploring where your shoulders are in relation to your neck, you know, and then just, you know, you want them back comfortably. You don't want to force anything back because that's, tension's not good in singing. But we, we just want kind of a relaxed shoulders back kind of feeling. And then um, shaking the arms, you know, like just shake them out and then just feeling, because that's another part of posture, is it's not just how straight your back is, it's just that, you know, everything, you know, your arms are relaxed at your sides, just shake them out. And then also exploring the neck and head motion, just how far, you know, where, where is that going? So you can stretch your head and your neck forward and back, but not in a circle, that's not good for it. But then, you know, and then just, um, there, there it is. Then another, another good posture thing that I really like is exploring the, the tension that we usually have in our shoulders where you touch your ears to your shoulders and then you drop them, okay? I, I love this exercise. Everyone knows that I love this exercise. But you put your ears and the shoulders to your ears and then you drop them and it's just, you're like, wow, that's what relaxation feels like. And you don't realize all of a sudden you've been tense this whole time and now you finally have relaxed. And so we, we, we keep a lot of tension right here in our shoulders, especially if we're stressed. And singing especially will do that, and that tension starts to eat away at the, at the beauty of the sound. So what I have the choir do is I have them put their ears to their shoulders, then I have them drop it, most of you know this, then I have them do half of that distance and then drop it, then I do half of that distance and then drop it, half of that, half of that, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're like, you're like reducing it like, like this half-life of tension, and then you finally get it down to where like half of that, and they're barely moving it, and then, and then you make them relax, and it's like, wow. My, I didn't know my shoulders could go that low. So it's just an idea of getting everything down but, so it's relaxed, but also open and back. So, and then uh, so speaking of the power of language, another thing you, you, need to, you, you can do is use words to describe healthy singing posture. I've written some of those down, like buoyant, you know, have, let's have some buoyant posture, like when they're standing, you know, just getting them sh feet shoulder width apart, getting their... You, getting them just feeling, you know, the balls of their feet and just kind of rocking on their feet, and just, just being buoyant, being ready to sing, 
Um, and then and you, you also demonstrating that. And that's the thing is too, what your posture is is going to reflect on them. You know, if you're kind of if you're kind of doing this and you're conducting, I mean, you're, there's no way you're going to get them to do, you know. But if you're if you're like this, you know, it's the, that leadership idea again of do what you expect them to do. Breathe with them, stand as you want them to stand. That kind of thing. Buoyant, expansive, alert, vibrant, flexible, poised. That's a good word. I like that. Poised, tall, loose, free, happy, balanced, all those words. You, I mean, you can be tall and loose. You want to be relaxed and tall and poised. You know, so it, it's, it's a balance between creating a tense instrument that's, you know, at attention, but creating one that's open and flexible and buoyant, but yet not constricting anything. You know. Seated posture is just as important. I mean, it's pretty much everything from the waist up. Um, there's, there's two ways to do it that I've, I've written here. Hips well back in the chair, and then the back, you know, think of straightening the small of your back as you're sitting on the back of your chair, you know. Just feel that. that. That's one way. Or to put your hips forward in the chair kind of like you're sitting on the edge of your seat. And I, I kind of like that because it gets them, a, there, you, you can't really, because if you're sitting in the back, you could just kind of slouch and it still look like you're straight, but you're really leaning back. But if you're on the edge of your seat, there's an excitement there. And just kind of feeling the, on the edge of your seat and just that back, just think of your back just becoming taller from the smaller your back up and then up through your neck. And then both feet on the floor as if standing. So, you, so it's like you're standing, you have your good posture and then you just sit down and then there you are, just sitting. Now, when you have posture problems in rehearsal, there's, there's a lot of ways to deal with it if you, if you really notice it becoming a problem. There's, there's good ways to reinforce good posture throughout the rehearsal. Just get them to keep maintaining and creating, recreating the instrument. And one way is to just not say, well, fix your posture. You, you know, a lot of you have bad posture. You need, you need to work on that. <laughs> you need to fix it. One, a one good way is to just think of some creative ways like, like um, show bad posture, say, okay, okay, you stop everything, okay, everyone, uh, imitate me. Okay, all right, now imitate me. You know, like, this. so just do the bad, do, that's like called negative practice, where you like do negative practice with them so they feel the really wrong way, and then do the right way, and then they'll, and even some, like, like Dr. Rayo was saying, he says when you, you know, if you do that, then all of a sudden when you're doing this, if you say, okay, imitate me, then all the people who are kind of slouching, they'll kind of sit up because they know what you're going to get at. <laughs> so those exercises really don't have any singing involved at all. Then the second group is breathing, okay? Now if posture creates the instrument or it creates the mechanism, breathing prepares the mechanism for singing. So breathing is a something that it's, it's not about getting oxygen in the lungs. I think it's easy to think, well, I'm, I'm going to take a deep breath because it's a long phrase and I've got I've to get air. I've got I've to, you know, it's like it's almost a survival thing. It's not about having enough air to, to get through something. It's about setting up the vocal mechanism and get it ready for singing. Because what it does, when you breathe in, it lowers the larynx. I mean, you can put your hand here on your, on your voice box and if you breathe in, you'll feel if you breathe in properly, the voice box kind of goes down. And the idea is when you breathe in, that's how you, that's how you sing. And everything stays open. Ah, oh, ah, oh, you know, instead of, uh, and, then you, and then it comes back up. But, but breathing, it's, it gets everything kind of low, and it gets everything, it, your diaphragm flattens out. And then you, then you have this, this energy that you can send, and the sound gets sent through on the breath. And so that breathing sets up all that. So you have the instrument created, you set it up by breathing, and then, then the next set is the phonation when you actually do, do sing. But let's talk about breathing a little bit more. You can give them images to think about breathing, and I've written these down here, uh, to help them feel a low breath. Because what you want them to feel is a low breath. Because we, what we don't want is them to breathe and then see shoulders rise, as if our lung, God put our lungs right here, which he didn't do. But everyone kind of lifts their shoulders. But what we want is, if the diaphragm is flattening, well then, then there, you should almost feel your guts go out, which is pretty much what you're supposed to feel. You should feel expansion all the way around down here when you breathe in, like that. And when you, you know, you can lie on your back, you, well they wouldn't even do this in rehearsal, but you can lie on your back and put a book on your belly and make it go up when you breathe in and make it go down when you breathe out. That, it, it's that kind of thing. 
But having them feel that low breath, there's a lot of images you can do to get them to do that. Uh, one is to have them drink in, I think I write, wrote these down, right? Yeah, drink in a thick milkshake through a straw or a hose. So everyone, and this is the thing, don't underestimate the power of using physical gestures to get them to, to, visual, to, to really feel what's going on here. So I want you, to, I want you all to take, take a, a big straw, kind of like one of those big straws, I don't know what restaurant, but some of them have you know, really big straws, like, well, how much do you want me to get out of this? And then, so grab that, and I want you, and you've got this milkshake, and I want you to just suck it in, suck in that air through that straw. Here we go, ready? And then you can let it out. But you feel, doesn't that really give you a really good feeling of like, wow, that's a lot of air? Try, try that again. To gra- have them grab it, and then have them take a drink. And then let it out. Okay? That's, a, that's really a good way to get a lot of air in. Another way is to inhale through a pinhole. I mean, like, you might just have them pretend they have this little tiny hole, like, a, like one of those little coffee stirs. Have a little pinhole in your mouth and breathe in that way. Here we go. Let it out. Yeah, it's a slower breath, isn't it? The air gets in slower, but it really makes you aware, wow, that's really, there's more down there than I thought was down there. Let's try that one more time. Yeah, good. Okay, that's something you can try. The other one is drinking a glass of water, but like it's a glass of air. Okay, like, like you're, you're just ha- have them grab a glass of water. Everyone grab a glass of water and then, and then take, take a breath in. Good, and then let it out. How does that, is that, these are all going to be different, you know, and they're all going to hit you a little differently, but the one caution you want to give them is don't tilt your head back when they're doing it, because you don't want them to breathe in and go, and then sing, because that's going to, that, that uncreates the instrument, if you want to say. Um, another, another great visualization that I really like is you get to the top of a mountain, you know, if you like to hike or you like to like to see a lot of scenery, and you get to the top of the mountain, and you look out, and you're like, like that, and you really take in a deep breath, because you're like, okay, so everyone, everyone do that, it's just, it's just, it's a quick, it's one of those quick breaths that I was saying earlier, it just gets in a lot of air, so here we go, that's why I like that analogy so much, is because it gets them to, like, really turn on their face when they breathe, because it's like, it's all about preparation, it's like, you know, the Sabbath doesn't start or, or you don't start thinking about the Sabbath Friday at sunset. You don't start thinking about singing right when you start singing. You start thinking about it as you prepare. And so even any facial expressions, any emotion, any mood you want from them, any, any dynamic, you want to see it on the breath. And you want to see them really turn it on at that moment, not when, and then turn it on when they start singing. But it has to be as they breathe. Because even when you talk, even when you have conversation, you start you're thinking about it long before you say it, and then when you breathe, that's really when you started the thought. I thought about, you know, or, hey, did you think about this? And you're, when you're breathing, that's where, that's where it's all happening. So that's another way to get them to really activate their breathing and to get them into the, into the excitement of the piece, into the energy. The other way is to smell a flower. Um, this, is, this would be breathing through the nose instead of, bre- like, the... the is breathing through the mouth and the pinhole and then everything else. But, um, but, the, um, but, but taking a flower and smelling it w- would be breathing through your nose. I want everyone to do that. Everyone grab a flower, and if you can just imagine what it would, like, a, like they kind of have some pretty unique smells, and then like what that would do to you. Okay, here we go. Take a breath in. Yeah, good. And I think, yeah, uh, when, if you really were to do that, what it would do, it really lifts the mask. Breathing in through the nose really lifts your mask, uh, you know, what we call the mask in singing, which is, you know, this, this area here. And you want it lifted because it gets a lot more space in there, so you can get a lot more resonance out, ooh, when you sing, and you get a lot more sound that way. So you lift your mask, and breathing in through the nose really does lift all that. And then what you can try is you can try different, different combinations of those things. Try one through the nose and one through the mouth, and then have them try keeping both cavities open. And then seeing, you know, if they can get a lot of air in that way. Because that's the thing is, it's kind of a combination of both when you sing. You kind of want to just have everything open here. And that's what I like about the drinking of the glass of water is because you're just opening it and letting the air pour in. Because the thing is, nature pours a vacuum. And if you open, if you just leave your mouth open, air is going in. 
you can feel air going past your, you know, through your tongue into your windpipe just by having your mouth open. And if you breathe out all the air that you have in your lungs, you get it all out. The moment when it all gets out, what happens? The vacuum at nature pours and then the air rushes back in. And then you start to bring it all in. So um, just some different physical things to try. Um, bend over and breathe. This is a good way, like the, the book thing, making the book lift and rise. If you bend over, you can get them to feel the expansion in, the, in their back if they put their hands uh, back here. And you just have them breathe and have them feel this expand. Or, you know, they'll feel, get all the air out, and then, and then they'll feel it down there if, if you have a choir where you feel like they're, they're just not getting this deep breathing thing. They're, they're breathing too shallow, but they're not, getting, they're not getting that deep breath in there. Also, hold your hands below your rib cage. That's another place to feel the expansion. When you breathe in, down there, you should feel it. You shouldn't feel anything really move up here, but it should all be down here. Okay, here we go. Try it again. Good. And then when they sing, have them keep their hands here. Like if, um, if I said, come thou almighty, if I went, come thou almighty king. If I can keep my rib cage expanded, that's really going to, actually everyone do that. Take a deep breath in and keep your hands here so you can feel the expansion and maintain that expansion as you sing. Here we go. Come thou almighty king. Good, now do it where you don't do this and just let all the air go out as quickly as, or just let, just, or just let this collapse, okay? So take a deep breath in. Come thou almighty king. And now, do it, now do it again with this, maintaining the expansion. Here we go, breathe in. Come thou almighty king. And that's a good technique to use to get them to keep the energy, keep the air, you know, like not to just collapse. That's one thing we want to avoid is them just collapsing in, in the sound. Now, the other, the one thing we don't want to do is have them tense up that way where they're like, come thou all but They don't want to let any air out because they're just trying to keep as much air in as possible. It, it's a balance between, you know, you want the air to be forward moving. You want there to be momentum. But you don't want them to just let it all out and then collapse. So... Keeping, keeping their hands on the ribs keeps, even keeps the posture kind of in line, too. It keeps everything kind of straight here. Now, um, another good breathing visualization is to breathe, have them breathe in the pitch and vowel. Like if they have to sing, you know, um, come, and they have to sing it on that pitch. To br as they're breathing, they're thinking that pitch. Come, come, like that. So they know... It, it just engages their mind sooner. And then um, it just also, the breathing in that vowel, come, it really sets up, the, it really truly does set up the mechanism to sing better because they're, they're singing that vowel or they're breathing that vowel in. Here's things to avoid or have them avoid, I guess, is what we're saying. Audible breathing. Audible breathing is a sign of tension. If, if you hear them go, like that, there's something in the way there. Just, if they just open, if they just stay open, you're, all you're going to hear is air going in. I mean, you're going to hear that. But if you hear everyone go, <gasps> you're like, whoa, that's, that's, that's wrong. That's tense. There's something wrong there. Let, just have them open up more. Maybe have them drink the glass of water or the glass of air, as we talked about. Um, also, lifting shoulders and chest, like I said. Another, thing, another good exercise, if people are doing that, if people are breathing too high and they're lifting their shoulders a lot, have them put their arms out and have them breathe in and have them only breathe in down here. If their arms go, you know, if, they, if, the, if their arms go up as they're breathing in, then we know there's a problem. That's very easy to see. And then they can see, they can see, whoops, I'm doing that. So have them breathe in and have this stay, stay the same. And then um, another thing to avoid is jutting the head or the chin when they breathe in. Like, there's, you know, sometimes people, you know, we we'll all do sorts of funny things um, out of habit. Then, <clears throat> after, after you've done these breathing exercises, like, just the same thing with the posture, you're going to want to reinforce that throughout the <coughs> rehearsal. You're going to make them keep, uh, make sure they keep doing that. And then, like I said, consider the influence of the conducting gesture on that on their breathing. You know, you're wanting them to keep the air flowing. And if you're doing this, you know, if you're kind of pointing at each thing, you're, you're kind of just 
um, just being jerky with it, then they're, that's, that's really going to send the wrong message visually to them. You want the conducting gesture to look like the air flowing. Okay? That, that might be another thing to help even your gesture. Think, okay, I want them, this is how their air is to flow out when they sing. Now, the third area we talk about, and this is kind of between breathing and phonation, or this is how breathing helps phonation, phonation being, you know, when you make sounds, uh, when you sing. We breathe in, and then that breath is used for support. That's what we call, we call it support. Now, I say that's kind of a, I put it in quotes. It's kind of a yucky word, because it's really just, here are just some ideas, though, for getting singers aware of support. We don't want them to, to be pushing. We don't want them to you know, try to support. It's not about like muscle, muscling things. But we breathe in. Okay, we have our posture. We breathe in and then that breath supports the sound. That's what's going to support the sound. And we want to get people aware of their support mechanism. And one good way of doing that is panting. I really like panting because it just gets you aware of these muscles in the, in the tummy area when you just go Really, it's just about making them aware of their body and what, what all the muscles that, that they have at their disposal. Not that, like I said, we, we want to caution them against muscling the sound. But there are, there's, there's exercises you can do where you, go, where you use the word hip, 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 or hip, 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 hip. You have them say that, and that gets, it's the same kind of hip, 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 or he, 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 he. Everyone, put your hand on your tummy and do. Yeah, so it's just a way to get them aware of those muscles as they breathe down and they're gonna they're, they're gonna send the air from that area. They're gonna wanna you wanna feel you know something happening down there and without it getting to an extreme of, of it being muscle. There is a danger of using staccato with choirs. Of, of he 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 has to come from the tummy because if they're going he 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 if they're cutting it off if they're making it staccato by grasping it then it's not any good he 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 he, he, he. if I'm cutting it off that way it's really going to hurt me um, these exercises really are just to make them aware of just these muscles down there that that kind of should involuntarily I mean once you get trained in this they kind of involuntarily work to support the sound. I mean, we kind of use them when we, when we speak. Um, but uh, it's just to make, make you aware of them, make them aware of those support muscles. But again, just notice the danger so it's not causing them to clamp off at the stomach, making the stomach kind of muscle the sound. We don't, we don't want that to happen. Now, the hist S is a great exercise to get them to feel, to maintain the expansion of the breath and then to feel that, that, um, that airflow, because that's, that's what it's about. You breathe in, and then you send the air out on sound. You know, and that, that air has to be a continuous airflow on the sound. So uh, I have people breathe in, deep breath, we do the breathing thing, and then when they breathe out, s do a hiss and make the airflow steady. So um, the idea here is about that they keep feeling the expansion. They, that they keep feeling the expansion and that they keep feeling a steady airflow. You know, if they're running out of air, stop. Because I wouldn't want anyone to sing like this. I gotta just keep singing, because it's, you know, it's gonna sound terrible if a choir sings like that. You know, if they just sing as long as they possibly can. So make, don't make it a contest about who can hold the hiss the longest. Make it like, how long can you hold it steadily and beautifully? Because that's what you translate into singing. It, it really works out well. Let's have everyone do that. Let's breathe in deeply. And then let's do a hiss and keep it sustained for a long time. Here we go. And you just try a steady. Keep it steady. Don't make any And then whenever it gets where you're going to, where it's going to sacrifice the steadiness or the, you know, the expansion, just stop. Mm -hmm. Then you breathe and start again. So um, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, that's the thing, because that's what we want to teach them in choir. It's like when you sing a phrase, you know, I don't want them to go, Come thou almighty king. I don't want them to do that. It's going to sound terrible. Come thou almighty king. 
Hi, Tiki. Have them breathe and come back in discreetly. And then so the, so the sound maintains a pure airflow. There's a, there's a pure solid airflow going on there. Now, and that's, that's one thing you can keep the hand below the rib cage and feel that, ex maintain that expansion as you hiss. You can combine those two. That really works well. Another great exercise is um, to do so you're feeling, they feel the support muscles, but then they also feel the steady flow. So see, when you do the s, 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 you don't feel the, there's nothing catching in your, in your vocal cords. You're not, you're not clamping anything off. You're just, s, 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 you're just stopping the S. You're just stopping the air through the teeth. Um, now, another, another good exercise, when you, now what you do then, a great thing to do is to transition from that hiss exercise to um, phonation, where you go into C, 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 where you're doing, um, or you're, you're doing it on C. So you're starting with the S sound, so they feel s the same thing, C, but they're turning it into phonation. And then by turning it into phonation, they feel that steady airflow going. C, C, C. Let's try that. Just sing that. C, C, C. Yeah, and then encouraging them to see the airflow continues to go just as it did on when they did the hiss. Yeah, make it feel just like the hiss, just on phonation. And, and then that the, that the singing now, the phonation, would have no bumps or, or kind of like struggling sounds. But C, C, it would just be a continuation of the airflow without any bumps, very continuous sound, very buoyant sound. I have a couple things about the balance, balancing the breathing in and the breathing out muscles. The ping pong ball image, as if it's suspended on a vertical stream of air or water. That's kind of what, the ping pong ball is kind of like the sound. And our breath support is, you know, the breathing and then the support. The breath support is kind of like that stream of air or water. And it's like you want it to have a steady flow so it maintains, it keeps that ping pong ball suspended. And it can't be too fast or what's going to happen? ping pong ball shoots off. The sound goes crazy. Or, and it can't be too slow because ping pong ball will just fall, you know, if it's not suspended. So that's kind of what, that's kind of the balancing act with singing is keeping a steady flow, and not going C, and just, you know, blowing it that way, or C, just not enough support. So it's just about that, you might just, if you, if you feel like they're, they're not, the, the sound isn't being maintained very well. You're like, well, it's like this ping pong ball being suspended on this air. And you just have to keep the air flowing to keep that. Imagine your sound is right here and it's that ping pong ball. See, and you just have to keep suspending it as you're singing. That might help them. Um, another, another great image, and because this involves physical motion, and again, I'm a big fan of physical motion equals what, like the actual vocal application. Doing a whisk. Like, like taking a whisk and like whisking, whatever the verb is, as they sing. And I, and I think this is, uh, everyone sing the word see and, and do this whisk motion for me. Here we go. See. Right, because sometimes when we sing, we, once we start the sound, we think we're done. See, and there the, there the sound is, and then we don't continuously create the sound. It's about support. And breath support is about maintaining the sound. Just like we maintain our instrument, we have to maintain the sound. Once we start singing, we have to keep the air flowing through that phrase. And so one really good thing is just to have people whisk, especially if it's a slow song. Here's another thing you can do. Let's do um, C, and let's do a really fast, small whisk. OK? Here we go. C. Good. Now do a really fast, big whisk. Here we go. See. Right, now, ha now do a small, slow whisk. See. And do a slow, big whisk. See. Yeah, and you can have them do it different. See. Like you can have them try different speeds and different sizes. And you'll hear, you will physically hear the sound change. It's amazing. And it gets, them in, it gets them engaged in the rehearsal. I mean, that's, we really want them to feel engaged. I mean, we want them to come back. We want them to like singing. So we have to keep them excited and engaged about that. Now, the uh, phonation. This, we could, we could term controlled exhalation. So it's like exhaling in a controlled manner. 
and, and uh, that, so you breathe and then that breath is supporting what is known as phonation or making sound, okay? One great way is to, to think about phonation is just starting the sound really without thinking. Like we just talk, we just start, we just start talking. We just start phoning. We breathe in and we do it automatically. That's really good in one sense because a lot of times w th there's this conscious physical effort that church choir singers will do especially because they're very enthusiastic and very excited and we don't want them to like ah uh, and then start making the sound but just ah uh, just start just start phonating you know just start without any conscious physical effort that's what we want to do we want them involved physically like, like I was saying with all these other things we can do, but we don't want them involved in making the sound. This is something that's been created in us. Well, this can just happen. You know, we can just breathe in, and then, and then when we exhale, we make sound. Now, um, think, we still want them to think the pitch, and to think the tone quality, and to think the dynamic, and think the, all those type of things, think the, the feeling and the emotion of the piece. So, um, and, and the vowel and all that, but we don't want them to to think about making the sound. So just think those things as you breathe in, ah, and then just start without any conscious physical effort, like I said. The uh, second point here being the, the open throat. Um, the idea that as you're phonating, you want the throat to feel pretty much open, like this open conduit. Like I said, the throat or the pharynx is the most important resonator, not the mouth part. So we want this, this area to remain, to feel open and not, not like it's all happening in the mouth. And then, like I said, open-throated singing is really an artificially imposed proce procedure. But you want to, so just kind of have them think about just kind of just having the, the pharynx area really open, okay? And then uh, some images, like I said, this, this is going to help make this a little more clear. The yawn sigh. <laughs> All singing should feel like sighing, like ha, ah, ah. ha. So kind of take in kind of a yawn breath and then sigh for me. Okay, let's everyone do that. Here we go. Ha. Ah. Yes, yeah, see, singing should feel that open and that relaxed. Ha. Ah. Okay, that's a really good exercise to have them do, just to have them ha, ah, because it's. Like I said, we don't want them consciously controlling the effort that's being done to make the sound. We want them to feel like there's no more tension or manipulation than there is in sighing. You know, oh. you know that's, that's, that's as much tension as we should sing with. Oh, like that. And um, another one is this, uh, yeah, yeah is a really good word if you, know, if you wanted them to do it on, I mean, you could make up any note, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 Just have, yeah, or um, doing, yeah, yeah, something like that. Just getting the, the yeah, the Y-A, yeah, gets them to feel openness. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, that, in addition to the sighing, are, are excellent techniques to try. The other really good one that will help them feel this kind of open, open throat area is hot potatoes in the mouth. Like when there's something hot in your mouth, you really kind of open up so you can get a lot of air in to cool it off. <laughs> so that's, you can just say, pretend you have a hot potato in your mouth. And then that's kind of the feeling you want when they sing, so there's a lot of area to resonate. Um, another one is the egg in the throat. Kind of like there's an egg in your throat, and you just have a lot of openness back there. So these are just some ways to kind of artificially impose this. Um, another, another thing is have the, sometimes just language is just a really good way to get them think, like I talked language about, about posture, buoyant and po poise and that kind of thing. Get them to think, say, get a low pitched breath. If they're not getting good openness, if the sound kind of, sounds kind of pinched, especially with maybe older sopranos or something, just say, give me a low pitched breath. There was this doctoral study that found that people thinking low pitched breath were judged as having better sound. Like, Oh, even if you sing high, like oh, if I sing that note, oh, I, I, there's something that gives me, it just gets me a little bit more open when I think, think a little lower pitch. And I was warned, still use that sparingly though, because it, it could, you know, you don't want to like force anything open and get too, too muscular about, about this thing. But just the, these are just images. If you can give them images or you can give them words to just kind of help them open these things up without making them force anything, that's, that's really going to be beneficial. 
also um, try, when you're thinking about breathing in the pitch in the vowel, have the breath be infused with the pitch in the vowel, as if, like, if this is the, you know, oh, if they have to sing that note on O, oh, oh, have them think, oh, like, like the breath is going in with that vowel. It's all one, and then that's going to keep everything open. Oh, when they have to sing that word. Um, also, another image is to breathe until it feels cool at the back of the throat. A yawn kind of does that, you know, or yaw kind of does that, or a hot potato. Make it cool down in the back of the throat. That's a really great, great thing to think about. Another, another thing to really help with the, with the open throat back here, or kind of feel open kind of in this area, in the back of the mouth and in the throat, is to have, is so consonants don't get in the way, use exercises that keep the tongue forward. So the tongue isn't back there, kind of getting in the way. If you have all the space back there and the tongue's back there messing things up, you know, it's gonna get in the way of that space. You want the tongue to stay forward and the space to stay open in the back. So if the tongue is forward, that's gonna be really helpful. Now exercises you can do, any exercises that have v and v in them. V gets the tongue up there, v. Um, v, 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 or, or if you want it in the field, the open throat with the tongue forward. Tho, 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 tho. So they hear O or A, va, 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 or va, 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 va. If they do a V, make sure the, te the tongue is at the teeth, at the bottom teeth. V, 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 vo, 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 vo. Just keeping everything kind of forward and the tongue open in the back. Talk about now tips on avoiding tension and tightness in the singing. That's another thing where, like I was saying, keeping, keeping the throat open keeping everything kind of open and, and relaxed, we want to avoid them being tense or being tight in the, in the singing process. When you set up your vocalization session, okay, I'm going to start with posture, we'll do a little breathing exercise, we'll turn that in, we'll do a little support exercise, and we'll do, when we get into phonation, I don't want them to start tightening up. So always begin, like I said, always begin with an easy kind of descending interval. I have, um, I like nu, 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 or nu. It's something that goes down. It's something that it, it, there's just you know if I have them go nu, 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 nu. I mean if I have them do that the first thing it's going to like really start to add tension. So the first thing you want to do because in fact I I went to a different core rehearsal after being in college. I came here and I went to another choir rehearsal somewhere else and I saw someone. Uh, at another university, and they started the choir, and they were like, sing V, and they have everyone sing V, like right at the beginning of the rehearsal, and I was just like, ouch, you know, please, let me, let me, I mean, there is a little bit of a warm-up process that has to happen there. You have to let them, I mean, that's just going to build a lot of tension in the group if you get them really singing tight at the beginning, and I mean, there's something to say about energy, but, or just, I like starting on the word nu and just kind of getting everyone. It's it's more like that's better. To, it's better to start low key and then get everyone kind of like interested. Kind of get their you know everyone's now getting their mind in the game and then you can build the excitement. Uh, nu no or na on a descending five note scale. Na 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 or na maybe without the consonant because the consonant can tend to add tension sometimes if we don't if we're not careful. Another thing, just to keep tension low at the beginning, um, let's, let's do na, just like I was doing. And I want to I wanna show you something. Na, na, na. Now, compare that with this. Na, na. So what I do differently the second time? More time. Then all of a sudden there's this kind of ballpark feeling of just it, in creating intensity that we don't we don't need at the beginning of the rehearsal. You wanna you wanna have like just to keep them relaxed. You can add, like I said, you can add the energized stuff a little later. But that's a really good way to keep everyone, keep the voice, real, especially in the morning, on those morning rehearsals. It's like, let's just let them ease into it, 
you know, it's like hot water. You've got, you can't jump in and get used to it. That's cold water. You've got to let them ease into it so there, there isn't any, any um, damage done. Um, avoid any heart attacks, any heart attacking kind of um, exercises at the beginning or, or even, even, the, uh, even when they have an exercise that starts on a vowel, like, Make sure they're not going e. Make sure they're not starting those vowels with hard attacks. So I said, imagine the throat is merely a valve. It's just like this valve opens and closes. There's no like e. There's no something that you do there that really kind of juts it in. And and that's where the conducting gesture really helps. If we can just have the gest each beat is just a fluid change of direction or each ictus is a fluid change of direction, it's going to be great. Uh, it's going to really help them. And then when you tell them not to, you know, attack something, you're actually showing it and you're, you're already showing it in your gesture. I, I also, another image is if this helps them, I mean, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this, but um, imagine a violin bow. You know, it's always moving. You know, and a violin just starts the sound. It just kind of starts out of nothing. And then, it, then it's always moving and it never stops. I mean, I guess it stops if they want to make it a little choppier sounding. But it's like that's, if we want singing that's very fluid, you can just have that image of the bow always moving. And sometimes it moves quickly, you know, or, or even on one note, it'll move quickly, but it still is moving. And then sometimes it'll move slowly, you know, to make a different sound. Another um, image, I said, imagine a balloon. You, you know, there's no need to, like if there's, if there's a hole in it, well, I mean, you know, like, you know, if you put tape over a balloon and you pick, put a hole in it, it doesn't pop, you know, and then it, it just kind of air releases. You don't need to squeeze it to get the air out. Just, just let it, you know, just let it release. It'll just release air automatically. So as they're singing, just, ah, just, you know, there's no need to, like, grab anything like that. Now, this, um, this point number, I don't know what point, it, yeah, point number four on your deal there is about the Bernoulli effect, the aerodynamic theory. Um, your vocal cords, when you're not using them, look like this. Okay, they're they're apart. When you phonate, when you when you uh, yeah phonate or make sound, they come together, you know. And it's it's the friction of the two cords coming together that make noise, that makes sound. Okay, and it's the air, the air that comes through those two chords that brings them together and starts making that sound. You know, if you put two pieces of paper here and I, and I blow through them, they're not going to blow apart. They come together. You know, that's the Bernoulli effect. Paper, air goes between two folds like that. They're going to come together. So that's one thing you can, you can teach them and tell them. The air needs to be moving for these to, to come together and that really creates a nice yeah, you know, that's, that's how phonation works. So by moving the air, you keep the vocal cords together. People who don't, aren't moving the air or, or they're letting too much air through, there, there's just lots of different things that can happen. Um, avoid trying, uh, here's one thing you'll want them, uh, maybe you might run into this. I've just tried to put everything down here that you can re reference later. But avoid trying to sound too mature. You know, like if they, you know, they want to sound bigger or, or a sound that rings or, or just watch those muscles between the larynx and the, and the point of the, the chin. Just right there, just getting too tense. And I think if, if you're getting anything from this, the name of the game is no tension. You know, getting them to just sing in a natural way um, that's not tight, but that is very energized by the air, but not by anything muscular that you're doing. You know, it's, it's through air mainly. The release phase, when we stop the sound or we cut off, as we were saying earlier, this release phase, teaching them about that and saying, look, this is not a cut off. I don't want you to just like, you know, just like grind to a halt on the sound. Ah! And then do that where you clamp it off because that's going to really be dangerous. But you want, have them have, think about like singing through the release. Like, if you sing, ah. It's almost like the air is still going. You've just kind of stopped phonating. Uh, everyone sing, sing that note on ah uh, and clamp it off when I cut off. Here we go. Uh. Good. Now do it where you imagine singing through the release. Here we go. Uh. Yeah, there's just a little bit of a, a feather on the end that's just a little bit more nice to hear than hearing that, that kind of ramrod there. Um, another great 
another great visualization is exhale through the release. Okay, sing that again and, and like ah. Okay, try that. Ah. Yeah. So that that gets this, that kind of takes that edge off the end of that sound. And even if I want to clean, I mean, if we want a clean cutoff, quote unquote, or a release, usually it's done through the through the consonant cat. You know, that's how it's done. You know, or even if it ends on a vowel, even like day, I'm not going to have them do that. Even I'll have them say day. I'll have them have them do the little ya yeah at the end. So so there's always there's always something happening at the end that's not causing us to to um, you know, hurt ourselves. Like I said earlier, the way the conductor indicates the release affects the sound. What you do is going to tell them how to release it. And it, if you do something like day, like that, you're, they're going to clamp it probably, probably. And if you go day, and you keep the hand even moving on that rebound, day, like that. I mean, you'll see conductors, their hand's still going after the cutoff because they, they want, they just you know, want to hear that sound they don't want to hear anyone just break it off. Um, be careful of the effect your descriptive words or demonstrations may have on how the sound is. Oh, wait, wait, hold on, how the sound is produced. Yeah, be concerned with process over product. I know it's easy to say, um, well, I want it to sound like this, so I'm going to I'm going to do anything possible to get them to sound this way. And then you're doing all these sort of funny vocal things that are really kind of hurting them but the product sounds good in the short term. So be concerned with how they're producing the sound. Be concerned with how they're getting the sound that they're getting. And like I said, how they produce the sound is much more important than just making the right sound. Um, you'll hurt them if you use a quick fix that makes it sound okay for the moment, but is vocally not as healthy as the right way. You know, I mean, we're getting, I mean, we, we want to be healthy about this. We want to be, uh, you know, following the way it was, it was intended to work, and if we don't, you know, then that's, that's going to hurt us. Then the fifth part is about warming up the mind. Okay, so you've you've got them, you've got them postured up. You've got them breathing right. You've got them. They, they they're aware of their support muscles now. You're having them phone, do some phonation exercises. Start easy, and then but then you also want to kind of get them, like to warm up the mind. And one good way to do that is um, well, there's a lot of different mental exercises that go along with vocal exercises like um, solfege. I mean that's a do re mi fa sol la ti do. One thing to do is do, um, you know, you can, or you can, um, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, and do, mi, re, fa, si, so, you know, have them do things to just kind of engage their mind. Another thing to do if they do, um, have them leave out a note. Have them leave out every other note or every three notes, and like that really gets them thinking about the pitches. Because the thing is, we think about the pitches that we sing far too little. You know, we 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 don't think about what they sound like enough. Right in there, but Dr. Rail said the most profound thing we can do, and this is what he said at that symposium. I wrote this down. The most profound thing we can do is engage people, engage them physically, emotionally textually and mentally. Like we want to get them engaged in the rehearsal. We want to get them engaged physically, um, you know, emotionally. Uh, we want to get them engaged about the text. We want to get them engaged about um, the mind. You know, they want to get their mind engaged. We want to just get them active in this rehearsal, get them engaged. So in that lecture from 2004, I didn't give many specific scales or arpeggios. I mainly discussed principles based on the categories of vocal technique that can be addressed while vocalizing. Most of the exercises we do in terms of material we are singing are based on scales, stepwise motion, or arpeggios, an outline of a chord. Usually we do major scales or arpeggios, but sometimes we can use minor. to get them to think a little differently. And most of these exercises, we usually go up or down by half steps. Or down. But I don't want to give a set of prescribed exercises because that will increase the temptation for a less adept conductor just to play this recording for a choir, not really interact with the group on the aspects of vocal technique. 
So I wanted this lesson to focus more on the principles of what we are trying to accomplish with all the vocal exercises. I hope you have enjoyed this lesson and all these videos. If you have any questions, you can contact me at purplemozart at gmail.com.